It's a policy that's been studied both by lawmakers here in Hartford and by Congress in Washington, D.C. Every time it's looked at, it's found to have serious and growing problems. Yet the policy remains, and so do the consequences. This is me and that's you. My name is Gail Sokolnicki, and my mom is Helen Matalavich. My mother was a great mom. I received a phone call about midnight on that night, June 12th from a doctor in the emergency room at Yale telling me about my mom being um, pushed. Bang! Oh, I went from loop. I was going down, 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 and then I hit my head and my back and I heard everything crackle. My mom was an extremely independent person. It absolutely changed her life. That's all my life, till I die. She took, she took everything away from me, my activity. No more. I called media, I called politicians, I begged for help. What system failed your mom? The government. Many millions of Americans. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal reforms in the 1930s created public housing. And within the bill that established this new safety net for Americans, a controversial definition was written. The word elderly was defined to include people of any age with disabilities. That decision mixed older and disabled Americans together to live for years to come. In the 1970s, Helen Matalavich moved into Seymour's newly built Callahan house. A wife and a mother, her husband had passed away, and her kids were grown. My mom's housing authority was strictly seniors when she first entered it. But over time, her neighbors began to change. As seniors were passing on, other people were filtered in. Those people being filtered in had disabilities. This trend was due to several factors, including the emptying of mental hospitals. From the 1950s to the 1990s, Connecticut mental hospital patients dwindled from 9,000 to around 900. An overall shortage of affordable housing left some former patients with nowhere to go but into elderly housing. Across the country, fights, clashes, and crime began to occur. Congressional concern led to a federal study in 1992, and they followed up with some changes, but problems continued. And in Connecticut, the issue was studied in 1998 and yet again in 2004. Mixing populations in state elderly slash disabled housing projects. Nonpartisan analysts presented their findings to Hartford lawmakers. If we don't do anything, the disabled population in, in these facilities is going to continue to grow. We must, absolutely must, do something about the crisis. But nothing changed on the state level. I'm still thinking about it. I know I'm not fully prepared mm -hmm. to take action. Back at the Callahan House, Matt Lavage's home was starting to change. It had remained mostly elderly, but in the last decade, the young disabled population drastically grew. Soon enough, nearly half her neighbors were young disabled. The News 8 investigators wanted to find out if the predictions made in decades worth of studies are accurate today. We spent a year collecting information from all the state's housing authorities, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Connecticut's Department of Housing, and the Housing Finance Authority. The bottom line, the problem is only getting worse. The disabled population continues to rise in many housing authorities across Connecticut. From Torrington to Portland, Hartford to New Haven, and Milford to New London, in other places like East Hartford, buildings house nearly all disabled residents, and wait lists show high demand by the disabled into the future. While the state prepares for an unprecedented aging population, housing meant for the elderly is increasingly not occupied by the elderly. And a toll has been taken on many Connecticut seniors. Allie, that's my favorite little Allie. Madelavage is a great grandmother at the age of 96. Oh, here she is, little face, little face on her. Photographs show the many good memories she's made in her long life. Her family, vacations, and time with her daughter, Gail Sokin Licky. Every Saturday, I used to pick you up and we used to go grocery shopping. Yep, yeah, that's what I miss, honey. Me too. But without the photographs, her mind drifts somewhere else to a memory that is much darker. I try to forget it. I'll never forget it. Never. 
Madelavich lived at the Callahan house until June 2015. My mom was a very active uh, senior citizen. I-26. She was a regular at Friday Night Bingo. Her and her girlfriend Joan would provide uh, coffee and cupcakes and things for their little social group. But Friday, June 12th, would be her last game at the Callahan house. She hit me so hard that I was someone to get, get myself balanced, and I went down and hit my head. Another resident, a woman she knew, assaulted her that night. And I heard everything crackle. And I laid there till they took me in the ambulance. Doctors found broken bones, both a humerus, the bone running from her shoulder to elbow, and her femur, the thigh bone, required surgery. Has lost the use of her right arm. Can maneuver it a little bit, but needs a lot of help with a walker. Now I can't even write my name. Matt Lavage's attacker was 59-year-old Elaine Elwood, who moved into the Callahan house in 2007. She qualified to live there because of a psychiatric disability. She was caught in the crossfire of, you know, a handicapped person that couldn't help themselves. So can Licky trying to bring the assault to the attention of state officials. I wrote letters and got no responses. I recalled people and got no responses, and I was told that nothing could be done. Federal officials at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which funds the Callahan House, received letters too, yet nothing changed. And years before Madelavich was attacked, Callahan House residents warned legislators of trouble and problems with the growing mix of elderly and disabled, and they are not alone. Attempts were made for years by housing authorities, by residents, by legislators. But none of this ever prompted action. Sokin Licky hoped that her mother's attack would be the impetus for change. They always said, I'd get back to you, and they never did. I think that we need to to find somebody that's going to help these seniors um, have a better quality of life in their housing authorities. I just think about, you know, the kind of building that I would want my, my mother, my grandmother to live in. Waterbury Democratic Representative Larry Butler is the chair of the housing committee. He has supported reform in the past and says he will keep trying. But for Matt Lavage's family, the attention is a little too late, but still important. I just want this story out there so everybody can be helped. The court placed Matt Lavage's attacker in a program for those with psychiatric disabilities to keep her out of jail. But even though it is in the court's hands, Matt Lavage wants her own kind of justice. I don't want to see her face to face with me and show her my body. The story doesn't end there. In the coming weeks, we'll introduce you to a disabled resident who's been failed by this policy. We'll show you the financial impact on housing authorities, and we'll introduce you to officials who say the status quo is working just fine. In the meantime, we invite you to head over to WTNH.com and take a deeper look into this story with interactive maps and behind the scene photographs. For now, we're in Hartford. David Iverson reporting for the News 8 Investigators.